Good to see each one of you here this evening, and for those who are joining with us uh, by way of Zoom, we're certainly glad to have you here tonight as well. And if you have your Bibles, let's turn together once again to the book of Job, and Job ver uh, chapter 36, chapter 37 will be our focus for this evening. Job chapter 36, chapter 37. One of the things that we learn in studying the Psalms, one of the, one of the great lessons that we learn from those passages, we learn how to worship God. We, we, we learn what it means to worship God, to honor God as he deserves. And, and, and we find such wonderful passages. Of course, I'm not going to read them all. Let me just share couple of them with you. Psalm 29 and verse number two, give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord and the beauty of holiness. Uh, Psalm 95 verse six, oh come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Uh, Psalm 96 and verse number nine, oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. And Psalm 99, verse number nine, exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill for the Lord our God is holy. As we consider these verses and, and many others that we could mention, there's one thing that, that becomes perfectly clear. And the thing that becomes perfectly clear, it is impossible to worship and to complain at the same time, okay? It, it, it's just an impossibility. It's impossible to worship and complain at the same time. Remember, we met Elihu back in chapter 32. He was, he was the youngest, and to be real honest, he was the most spiritual of those friends who came to visit with Job during his crisis circumstances. And we have, we've seen how that Elihu became angry. He was angry with, with Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar. He was angry with them because, because of their attacks against Job. He was angry with them because of the humanistic logic reasoning that they were, that they were trying to impress on Job. And, and actually he was angry because in spite of all they claimed, they had done act, actually nothing to help, to encourage, or to comfort Job in his circumstances. They, 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 they were miserable. Miserable comforters are y'all. Remember, that's what Job said. And, and then we saw that he was also angry with Job. Not only is he angry, Elihu, with these three friends, he's also angry with Job because Job was constantly defending himself. He's constantly justifying himself. He's declaring that he's innocent of any sin. He's innocent of any wrong, which basically revealed a, a deep-seated problem that maybe Job didn't even realize he had up until this point, and that was the problem with pride. He, he's got a pride problem. He's got a pride problem. And, 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 of course, God's going to deal with that, and we're going to start seeing that next week when we hear God himself is going to begin to speak. But, but it was not because or it was because uh, of his pride that Job then started complaining. He, he feels like God is not doing him right. Uh, God is not treating him justly. God is not being fair with him. And, and in other words, it's the idea, I deserve better than what I'm getting, right? I deserve better. That's pride, folks. That's pride. And so, and so he's got this problem with pride. God's not treating him right. And so we've seen how that Elihu then confronted Job. And we've seen him telling Job over the past couple of weeks, first of all, he told him, stop complaining. God is great. He's greater than man. Just stop your complaining. God is great. And then he said in chapter 34, he said, Job, you need to stop your complaining because God is just. He, he is just. You, you think he's not being just with you or fair with you, but, but he is just. God is just. Stop your complaining. Chapter 35, we saw it last time. He said, stop complaining because God is righteous. 
God is righteous. And now in our text tonight, in our text tonight, we're going to see Elihu adds a fourth point. In our text tonight, Elihu is going to continue by telling Job that he should stop his complaining because the Lord God is worthy of worship. Regardless of what your circumstances might be, God is worthy of our worship. And so we need to stop complaining. As we go through these chapters together, Elihu is going to do a couple of things, and, and, and we're going to try to cover a lot of ground, and we're going to try to cover it quickly. And so, and so let's just jump, jump right in here. Uh, God's greatness. Elihu is going to declare God's greatness. And he begins in chapter 36 and verse number one. He says, Elihu also proceeded and said, suffer me a little, and I will show thee that I have yet to speak on God's behalf. Now remember, uh, Job has been questioning God's character, right? Job has been questioning God. He didn't curse God like Satan wanted, but he's questioned the character of God. God is unjust. God's unfair. God's unkind. God's unloving, blah, 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 you know. And, and, and so he's been doing all of that, been doing all of that, been questioning God's character. So Elihu says, now I just want you to, now I am going to, I'm going to stand up for God. I'm going to stand up for God. And, and, and I want you to understand that he is righteous in everything that he does. And so he continues in verse number three, I will fetch my knowledge from afar. In other words, from seeing how God has worked in the days of old, I, I, I'm going I'm to gain my knowledge from, from what I have learned from history. And, and not only that, uh, I will ascribe righteousness to my, my maker. For truly my word shall not be false. He that is perfect in knowledge is with the. In other words, Elihu has a very clear understanding. Some would look at this and say, well, isn't he a proud little fella? But, but the truth of the matter is, the truth of the matter, Elihu has a very clear understanding. He has a clear understanding of the issue at hand. He's going to give his opinion. He's going to give it honestly. He's going to give it truthfully, and he will be unbiased. He will be unbiased by passions or by prejudices. He's just going to tell it like it is. Okay. That's the main idea. He's going to tell it like it is. Uh, Elihu is not interested in building his own reputation. He, he's not interested in making a name for himself. He's only concerned with defending the Lord God's reputation. And so he says in verse number five, behold, God is mighty and despiseth not any. He is mighty in strength and wisdom. And then he's going to show two things here. First of all, he shows that God does not preserve the life of the wicked in verse number six. Uh, remember, remember Elihu said before, back in chapter 34, uh, verse 25 and verse number 26, he says concerning the Lord God, he, he knoweth their works. He overturneth them in the night so that they are destroyed. He striketh them as wicked men in the open sight of others. No, God does not preserve the lives of the wicked. God deals with the wicked. He brings judgment upon the wicked. That was the point that Elihu was making. But not only does Elihu contend, contrary to what Job was thinking, that, that God preserves the life of the wicked, uh, Elihu counters that. And then he also makes the statement that God does what is best. He does what is best for the poor or for the afflicted. In other words, he watches over the righteous. In verse 6 and verse number 7, we find that. He, he, he looks over the righteous because he has destined them to be exalted and to sit in places of honor. That, that's what God is bringing them to. And, and so he, he, does not, he does not overthrow them. Rather, he does what is right. He does what is best for them. So with that in mind now, Elihu is going to speak of God's greatness and he's going to show the greatness of God in the way that he deals, first of all, and the way that he deals with the righteous, how he deals with the righteous. The, the, the question that was in those days, it's the same question that many people ask even today. If the righteous are destined for glory, then why do they suffer so much? If, if that's where we're headed, then, then, then why do we have to suffer? 
Why, why, why all this suffering? And, 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 and so Elihu is going to say in verse 8, verse 9, he says, And if they be bound in fetters and be holden in cords of affliction, then he showeth them their work and their transgressions that they have exceeded. He openeth also their ear to discipline and commandeth that they return from iniquity. Why do the righteous suffer? Simply because those who are righteous, we're still not perfect. We still have our own problems. We, we still have our own difficulties. Uh, things are not as they ought to be in any of our lives. There are none of us who can stand before God and say, I'm exactly what God wants me to be. I wish I could say that, but I have to tell you, I can't say that. And I'm pretty sure you can't either. Pretty sure you can't either. The truth of the matter is God allows us to suffer so that he might get our attention, so that he might open our eyes, so that we can see the problems that are in our lives. They can see our transgressions. And, and, and then so that our ears will be open and we will be attentive to hear his instruction and to hear his correction, you see. And so, and so then he goes on in verse 11 and says that if they will obey and serve him, then they're going to be blessed. In verse 12, he says, if they do not obey, they will die without knowing why. In other words, Elihu's point is that the Lord God allows trouble to come into the lives of the righteous, bottom line, so that they might be purified. He allows trouble to come, problems to come, so that they might be purified. In other words, so that the righteous will become even more righteous, or like the song we sang just a moment ago, we become more like the master, more like the master. And so this is God's dealings, God's dealings with the righteous. But then Elihu, now he's going to look to the other side of the coin, and he's going to talk about God's dealings, God's dealings with the hypocrites, God's dealings with the hypocrites. In verse 13 and verse number 14, he says, but the hypocrites in heart keep up wrath. They heap up wrath. In other words, when difficulties and trials and testings come into their life, they become angry with God because of his dealings with them. They, they become bitter toward God because they don't like the way God is working and moving in their lives. And so, and so in the hypocrites in their heart, they, they heap up this wrath against God, and they cry not when he bindeth them. In other words, they don't cry out in repentance. They cry out in anger because they're angry with God. And they die then, verse 14, in their youth, and their life is among the unclean. This is how God deals with the righteous. This is how he deals with the hypocrites. And after making these two points, then Elihu, now he's going to get real, he's going to get real personal. He, he's going to make a very personal <laughs> application for Job. Look at what he says, verse 15 to 17. He delivereth the poor in his affliction and openeth their ears in oppression. Even so would he have removed thee. Talking to Job. He would have removed thee out of the strait into a broad place where there is no straightness, and that which should be set on thy table should be full of fatness. But, and it's the same idea we saw before. The Lord God would have caused all of Job's crisis circumstances to end. God would have brought all that to a conclusion, but there was a problem. There was a problem. So now Elihu is going to focus. He's going to focus on Job's danger. He's going to focus on Job's danger. Remember a couple of weeks ago, back in chapter 34, verse 7 and 8, we saw that because of the persistent suffering, because of the lingering grief, because of the consistent, constant attacks of his friends. We saw how that Job had been pushed to the point. We, we, we likened it to being pushed over the edge. He's pushed over the edge, and, and he begins to speak. He begins to speak foolishly. In fact, he'd actually begun to sound just like a foolish uncle in the way that he was accusing God. 
He actually sounded like an unsaved man. And the way that he is accusing God of being unjust and unfair and unloving and, and, and all of that sort of a thing. And, and so therefore, Elihu, he's, he's going to now say this in verse 17 and verse 18. He says, but thou hast fulfilled the judgment of the wicked. In other words, Job, you have judged God just like a wicked man does. That's the idea. You have judged the Lord God in the very same way that a wicked man does. And because of that, judgment and justice take hold on thee. Because there is wrath, Job is angry with God because of his perceived injustices. Beware, lest he, that's the Lord God, take thee away with his stroke or his chastisements. And then a great ransom cannot deliver thee. Now, we need to remember, the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse number 17, for the Lord your God regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. Uh, in 2 Chronicles chapter 19 and verse number 7, there is there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, nor respect of persons, nor taking of gifts. So Elihu basically warns Job of the danger of thinking that he can, that he can bribe God. He, he, he's warning Job of the danger of thinking that he can get relief from his circumstances by making a deal with God. And so notice the question that Elihu is going to present in verse number 19, talking about God. He says, Job, will he esteem your riches? The, 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 does he look at your bottom line just to see how valuable you might be to him? No. Will he esteem your riches? No, no, no. Not gold, nor all the forces of strength. The idea is there, all of your resources. Not just your gold, but everything you own. All of it. All of it. Two other dangers that Elihu is going to mention that we find taking place in the life of Job. Not only was he thinking that he could somehow bribe God, but there was also another problem, another danger, and that is that Job was choosing death over life. He's choosing death over life. Remember we saw back in Job 3, remember how Job at the very beginning, he, he, de he despised the night of his conception? He, he despised the night when he was conceived. He despised the day of his birth. And, and, and the great desire and the thing that he wondered about was why in the world, after he was born, why didn't God just let him die? That was what he wanted. That, that, that was what he wished to happen. But since he was born, he, 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 he could only wish that, that, that he might die. And so, and so Elihu rebukes him for that. And, and he says in verse number 20, he says, desire not the night when people are cut off in their place. Don't, don't choose death over life. And, and then he gives another thing, and that is this. Don't choose your pride over God's correction. Don't choose pride over correction. Take heed, he says, verse number 21. Take heed. Regard not iniquity, for this hast thou chosen rather than affliction. In other words, Job, you are stubbornly holding to your pride. You're, you're stubbornly holding to this idea, which is a wicked idea, that you don't have any sin. And, and, and that just shows you do have sin because God hates pride, right? And, and, so, and so, Job, you need to understand you're stubbornly holding to your pride instead of submitting to God's correction. You're choosing pride over correction. And then Elihu says in verse 22 and verse 23, Behold, God exalteth by his power. Who teacheth like him? Who hath enjoined him in his way? That is, who, 
Who has ever instructed God in what he ought to do? Or who can say thou hast wrought iniquity? Talking to God. Who can say that? God, you have sinned. You, you have sinned against me. You haven't done it. Who can say that? Who can say that? And of course, these are all rhetorical questions. The obvious answer is nobody can say that. No one can say that. The bottom line is, is that Elihu recognized that Job's danger, what is he is really starting to think that God just doesn't know what he's doing. God just doesn't know what he's doing. That, 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 that's, where his, that's where his thinking is going. That's where his thinking is going. So then we see Elihu now, he's going, to, he's going to declare his advice because of this danger that he sees coming into the life of Job. Because of the dangers that he sees there, he, he's going to give some advice. Chapter 36, verse 24. He says, remember, remember that thou magnify his work which men behold. In other words, remember those works of God that are seen in the world of nature. Remember those mighty works of God that are seen in the world of nature. Every, every man may see it. Man may behold it afar off. Behold, God is great, and we know him not. Neither can the number of his years be searched out. Elihu is making the point that instead of complaining about God, Job ought to focus on exalting God. Instead of complaining about what God is doing and grumbling about what God is doing, Job ought to be praising him for what he sees God has done. And the reason is because the Lord God is simply, as we've already noted, he's worthy. He's worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our worship. And the fact is, all of our pain, all of our suffering, uh, all, all of our grief does not change the fact that God is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of our worship. Elihu's advice to Job is that he ought to be worshiping the Lord God because of a couple of things. First of all, because of his power. His power. Talk, talking about the power of God that is seen in the atmosphere. In fact, he's going to look into the world of nature, verse 27, down to verse number 30. For he maketh small the drops of water. They pour down rain according to the vapor thereof, which the clouds do drop and distill upon man abundantly. Also, can any understand the spreadings of the clouds or the noise, that is the thunderings, of his tabernacle. Behold, he spreadeth his light, that is the lightning upon it, and covereth the bottom of the sea. In other words, the lightning hits the sea and it spreads out over the surface. I I, 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 I looked it up on, online. So, you know, Google, it has to be true, right? But it said when lightning hits water, I didn't know this, but it said when lightning strikes water, the electrical charge does not penetrate deeper than 10 to 100 meters, depending on the power of the electrical bolt of the bolt of lightning, depending, depending on how strong that bolt of lightning is, depends on how deep it goes. But, 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 but it doesn't really go when you're talking about the ocean, it really doesn't go that deep. Really doesn't go that deep. Uh, these storms that are used by God in, in, in Job 36, verse 31, these storms are used by God to judge people. Elihu makes the point. These, these storms are used by God to judge people. He uses them to, to, to send a flood, uh, to, to send water to the earth, uh, so it is destroyed by a flood, or, or he sends water to the earth so that food will grow. You see, he, he, he can use it either way. Storms are used by God to judge people, to send floods, or to bring abundance. And these storms are perceived by men because, verse 32 and verse 33, they see the lightning and they hear the thunder. They see the lightning, they hear the thunder. In fact, even the cattle can see a storm that is coming, and by instinct, they begin to move toward a shelter. 
They, they, they will begin to move to a place where they will be covered and, and safe from the storm. And, and so and so he's talking about these storms that come. And, and in chapter 37 and verse number one, by the way, these two chapters, they really just kind of run together. But, but in chapter 37, verse number one, he says, at this also my heart trembles. I see the storms and my heart trembles and is moved out of its place. So, so Lee, uh, Elihu, he, he talks about the fact that Job, you ought to be worshiping God because look at these evidences of his power that are seen all around us, he, even in the storms that come, even in the storms that come. And, and then also he talks about Job, you ought to be, you ought to be worshiping God because, because of his voice, because of his voice. You see, it's through the thunderstorms of rain that the Lord God speaks. That's what you find in verse 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, the, the voice of God speaks great things that we cannot comprehend. He speaks through the storms. But the voice of the Lord God may also be heard in a couple of other ways, and that's in the snowstorms. In verse number 6, 7, and 8, uh, the storms that cause men to be unable to work, and beasts to go and hide in their dens. Snowstorms, snowstorms. Uh, Charles Spurgeon noted concerning this, when the Lord seals up a man's hand, he is unable to perform his labor. The Lord has an object in this, namely that all men may know his work. When they cannot do their own work, they are intended to observe the works of God. When, when you get to a place where you can't work, you're, you, 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 you can't get out, you can't do anything. Uh, I was raised in the South, in America. We didn't get snow very often and where I lived. But, but when we would get a little snowstorm, you know, maybe like a half an inch or maybe an inch. I mean, it's like everything shut down. I mean, they closed the schools. I, I mean, everything just shut down. Uh, we, we didn't know how to, how to work. And now you go up north. Uh, Yankees, I can even be a foot of snow on the ground. It won't bother them. They just, you know, they're used to that. But but for a lot of people, snow is a paralyzing thing. It's a paralyzing thing. And, and, and when we can't do our own work, Spurgeon's advice was that's a good time to focus on the works of God. And that's the point Elihu is making as well. Another commentator said it this way. He said, in many ways, a storm serves as an ideal metaphor for the spiritual problems in Job. While a storm presents all the outward appearance of chaos, of nature run amok, still throughout it all, we know that the creator remains in absolute control of every detail. And so he talks about the, the snowstorm. But then he also talks, number two, about the whirlwinds. He talks about the whirlwinds in verse 9, 10, and 11. He talks about those warm winds that bring tropical storms and the cold winds of winter that bring frost and, and, and that freezes the water. And, and, and by them both, by them both, uh, the earth again. The earth is watered. And, and that cycle, that cycle that, that Elihu is describing in verse 12 and verse number 13, that whole water cycle that we see in nature even to this day is turned around by his counsels. God is in control of that. It's turned by his counsels for the purpose of giving either correction or for showing mercy, one or the other. And after showing these things, then Elihu gives, gives some advice in verse number 14. Hearken unto this, O Job. Stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. In verse 15 to verse 18, he points out the fact that Job, Job, you do not know God's ways in nature. You, you, you don't understand all this stuff that God does in the natural world and the and the storms and the winds and the rains and the and the snow and all you you don't you don't know God's ways in nature. In verse 19 and 20, uh Job, you you don't even know how to talk to God. You you don't know how to speak to God. And, and in verse 20 and verse number 21, he says, Job, uh, you 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 don't even begin to understand the majesty of God. 
You, you, you don't understand God's majesty. In fact, notice what he says in verse 23 and verse number 24. He says, touching the almighty, we cannot find him. He's excellent in power and in judgment and in plenty of justice. He will not afflict. That is, he doesn't afflict without a cause. Men do therefore fear him, and he respecteth not any that are wise of heart. And so therefore, Elihu's advice to Job is that since he has, he has no business comparing himself to God. Remember that statement? I, I'm, I'm more righteous than God. Remember that statement? Yeah. Job, you don't have any, you don't have any business. You have absolutely no business at all comparing yourself to the Lord God. And what you really need to do is you need to stop your complaining. You need to stop questioning the Lord God. Rather, you need to be busy, humbly worshiping him, giving to him the glory that is due to his name, regardless of what we go through in our life. This is good advice for all of us. Regardless of what you're facing, what situations you're facing, either at work, at home, class, or wherever it may be, whatever situation it is you're facing, this is good advice for us all. In fact, bottom line, the advice that Elihu gives to Job in these two chapters is pretty much the same advice that the psalmist gave in Psalm 95. And not Psalm 95, verse 1, down to verse number 6. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. Why should we do that? Here's the reason. For the Lord is a great God. He's a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Did you catch the idea there? You know, we talk about worship, you know, and we talk about, we talk about you know, singing, and we talk about raising our hands to the Lord and worship and all of that. But, but really, the reality is, most of the time when you find people worshiping, you know where you find them? You find them on their knees. They're humble before God. They're humble before him and worshiping him. And that's exactly what the psalmist says here in our text. So when we're facing, when we're facing troubles, facing trials, seems like maybe God's not being fair with us. He's not treating us as well as we deserve then I hope we'll remember the admonition of Elihu that we'll stop complaining because God is greater than man. And, and, and that we'll also stop complaining because God is just. And that we'll stop complaining because God is absolutely righteous. And we'll stop complaining. We'll get on our knees and we'll worship him because he is worthy. He is worthy. The little chorus that we sing, Thou art worthy, Thou art worthy, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. Thou art worthy, O Lord. That's certainly true, isn't it? Certainly true. Heavenly Father, we thank you this evening for your word. And Lord, as we have come through this and we've seen this speech by Elihu, a series of speeches, actually, showing how that instead of complaining, how that we ought to look to you, how we ought to respond to you. And Lord, I pray that you'd help each one of us to learn from these things. I pray that you would help us that we might, that we might truly understand that you are great, you are just, you're righteous, and you are certainly worthy of our worship and our praise. God, forgive us for being complainers. Forgive us for being grumblers when things don't go exactly the way we want them to go. Lord, help us to always keep a right focus on you and to worship you because you are worthy of that. Pray that you would bless now in our prayer time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.